<clears throat> no, it's my great pleasure to introduce the last speaker in this session, Bob McKay, McKay who is uh, a farmer. So he is in the trenches. He's going to tell us the real world of farming and, uh, and his own experiments, I think, <laughs> with, uh, with growing without using GM. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, I'm using a walking microphone because I tend to wander around a bit. Um, usually when speakers get up to speak in front of people, they put this front slide up that says something along the lines of, hi, my name's Fred and I do this. Well, I put this one up because it's more entertaining. Um, if you've had time to read it, we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> so standing in front of you now is someone who uh, lives 30-odd kilometres away from one of the biggest GM research facilities in Australia. Um, in the town of Horsham, we have a, a, a facility called Grains Innovation Park. It originally started out as the uh, Victorian Wheat Research Institute and over various incarnations it's turned into Grains Innovation Park and it's run as a joint venture between private interests and the government. Um, the private interests are predominantly Monsanto and Bayer, who are two of the uh, major GM companies in Australia. And uh, a couple of the people who work there have called me a bioterrorist, and I'm very proud of the fact. <laughs> um, one of the things that science seems unable to do in this particular field is admit that there's an awful lot they don't know. Now, this is a paw print I found on my farm uh, about two years ago. That is a normal marker pen, which is about oh, 130 mil long, 13 centimetres long. We don't have any animals with that sort of paw in Australia, but I found a number of the paw prints, and some of them were 1.4 metres apart. I have no idea what did it, but one bloke assured me it was a puma. So the rules of farming. Farming is not just about feeding the starving millions, although that is important. But this is often given as the reason why we need to adopt uh, GM or GE in Australia. We are custodians of the land we farm and we don't just inherit it from our forebears, we actually borrow it from our children. So what we hand on is far more important than what we get when we start. And the other, one of the other rules of farming is when you go broke you have to stop farming because someone else will come and tell you that you can't do it anymore. So in agriculture, how fast can we run? How fast can we keep ahead of the monsters that are chasing us? We've been hearing about peak phosphorus. Now, when you consider that the Australian soils that we farm with across the other side of the ditch on the West Island are, in some cases, 300 million years old. They're somewhat leached, they're light, they're shallow, and they're very deficient, usually in phosphorus, although there are other uh, issues as well. Since we've been using herbicides, we've developed resistance in weeds at a rate that is terrifying me and seems to have other people even concerned a little bit. We're seeing an increase in the size of farms and that's having a community impact. And, and my concerns aren't just about the farm as such, or the soil. It's, it's a community and the community includes the shopkeepers in town, the local football club. Uh, rather one thing that rather concerns me is I'm one of the younger members of our local volunteer fire brigade and you can see the colour of my hair. Um, local football teams are disappearing or merging, they usually merge and then disappear. And one of the other things that's not considered in agriculture is what is the real cost of production because if we are taking from the land in a way that's not sustainable, that is a part of the cost 
but it's not measured in dollars. It will be measured by future generations who will be limited in what they can do because of what we have done before. Now, fertilisers, most of the crops we grow are very highly dependent on applied fertilisers. Uh, now, peak phosphorus, I've mentioned it before, it might be a little way off, but the price of phosphorus has gone from a subsidised price a few years ago in Australia of $14 a tonne to now somewhere near $700. Gives you some idea of the way our production costs are increasing. Nitrogen, which is an industrial product, is expensive to buy. It's now around the 700 a tonne as well. And it's very difficult to apply efficiently. Because what often happens, if you put nitrogen out in most methods, by most methods used, under weather conditions that are not ideal, you can lose almost all of it and get no benefit at all. And we usually don't seriously consider the micronutrients which I've got listed there. So just a, a, a bit of a quote here. Despite the large increases in fertiliser application rights, soil, uh, rates since 90, soil nitrogen reserves are still significant source of crop nitrogen. So we're putting it on, we're not getting it all, and we're still relying on what the soil can do. Weed control. Virtually every modern variety of, we, of crop that we grow is developed under the assumption that we'll control the weeds by chemical means. The weeds that we're now dealing with carry resistance to an, uh, an ever-increasing range of soils. For example, we have... <laughs> this is almost amusing to a New Zealander, but we have a major ryegrass problem in our area. Um, we can't kill the stuff in our crops. We've lost what are called the Group A herbicides. We've lost Group, G, group D. I think Group E's are nearly gone. Uh, basically, we have used up the relatively safe herbicides. We've now almost finished using up the safe, if you really wear, good protective gear herbicides. And we're now into the herbicides that'll probably just kill you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and GE crops carrying herbicide resistance are just exacerbating that, and there's a slide coming up shortly that will show that's it there, in fact. This is a, crop from, uh, this is a photograph from the US of A. And you can see the corn, which is about, what, half to two-thirds the height of the header, and the resistant weeds are taller than the header. And those weeds are resistant to glyphosate Roundup. Okay. So Monsanto want to introduce more Roundup resistant crops, which is just going to put more pressure on to create circumstances like this. Now, what hope has a farmer got when he's dealing with those sorts of things? In 1940, and this is an, this is an important change in, in agriculture, because energy is not going to get any cheaper. You know, at the moment, we're going through a bit where the oil price has dropped. I can... I can fairly confidently say it's not likely to stay low for uh, a very long time. But the efficiency of production in agriculture has dropped alarmingly. So we have to find better ways to produce the food to feed people. Another chart showing herbicide resistance. And this is just to glyphosate. Remember, we've got a whole bunch of other chemicals that um, the weeds are developing resistance to in conventional agriculture. Now, GM is being enthusiastically grasped at, particularly in Western Australia, the other side of the West Island, because over there, this herbicide resistance issue has become pressing. It's a really serious issue there, and they are grasping vigorously at GM, hoping it will get them out of trouble. Um, my prediction is it'll probably get them into more trouble. They um, had a uh, Minister of Agriculture uh, in the last few years combine their three or four 
crop breeding organisations in the state into one organisation, called it Intergrain, and then sold 10% of Intergrain to Monsanto. So Monsanto basically now have access to anything that Intergrain has developed over the last 100 years. And uh, one story I heard was that they just kicked out all of the original people out of the front offices and effectively took it over. So the Australian grains industry, which prides itself on producing high quality grain desired by many, by many international buyers, but we sell it as a bulk commodity. We do very little processing in Australia and we don't clean it. We just harvest it, whack it in a ship and flog it, usually in bulk. We talk about the quality grain we produce and, and in a lot of terms it is pretty good stuff. It tends to be fairly clean. It tends not to have smuts and bunts and, and fungi and things like that in it. Um, but all of the things we measure to define the quality of that grain are things that determine its suitability for industrial processing. Every one of them. We do not consider whether it's good for you, whether it's got nutrients in it, whether it's going to provide you with a balanced food when it is finally processed. So this is a chart of the receivable standards, and I'm sorry you can't read it, it, it was a... <laughs> but I'm quite sure you'd find it riveting. <laughs> but half of that page is what weed seeds and so on might be mixed in with the grain. You can read it until you're blue in the face and you won't find anything in there about nutrients. Climate change. This has really got us very concerned in Australia because we're dry already. Uh, where I farm has a very long-term average rainfall of 16 inches a year, 400 mil, and fairly variable. The last 20 odd years have proven to be even more variable. Um, one year I know I grew crops on 10 inches of rain, 250 millimetres, and actually grew pretty good crops because they fell at the right time. Um, no, uh, 2014, the rain didn't fall at the right time. We had all of our rain at the start of the year and we had very little at the end of the year and it was a shocker. It wasn't a very good year at all. The year before was a little bit similar, but I'll show you some photos from the year before that demonstrate um, what can be an outcome even when you don't have really good conditions. So the predicted decline in the various industries <coughs> due to climate change. Wheat down 9.6 in 15 years and down 13.4 by 2050 and so on and so forth. So this is in a world where we've got the population rising from what are we now, 7 or 8 billion to um, 9 billion I think they're talking of shortly. These are the kind of food production figures we're looking at. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that there could be a couple of social issues coming up. <laughs> so with that sort of background, um, basically, in my view, cropping agriculture is in trouble. Uh, we, we are stealing from our children in order to produce crops today. We are becoming increasingly dependent on the inputs of the nutrients. We're less competitive against weed populations for two reasons. Number one, it's because we're losing those chemicals that we've been using and having to use more vigorous, more dangerous, more efficacious chemicals. And because the crops we're, gro we're, we're breeding, and I use we in the broadest possible sense there without actually becoming royal, um, are bred with the, uh, with the assumption that we're going to have the chemicals to protect them from the weeds. And what we're producing is not trusted by many end users. Now, there's a bunch of markets that buy food. There's those people who are either by circumstance or by nature, they don't really care so long as it fills an, em fills an empty spot, they're happy. But at the other end of the market, there's those people who do care what they eat. And I imagine that most of the people in this room are those people. 
They're the people I want to grow food for because I care about what I grow and I'd like the people who use it to care about what they use. To me, that's important. We also now have markets controlled to a very large degree by larger corporations. In Australia, we had a number of um, bulk grain handlers, mostly state-based. Um, in Victoria, we had our own wheat handling authority. In New South Wales, they had theirs. Western Australia have mostly still got theirs. They have been combined and bought and so on. So now, basically, Cargill's are probably the biggest grain trader in Australia, and they're a Canadian canola oilseed company, mostly. This is a quote from um, a, a fellow in California about how people view food and what it's doing. So agriculture really needs to be, to my, in my view, a system thing. We can't look at each thing in isolation. If we use one chemical, that chemical might have the instant effect of knocking out a weed, if it works still, but it will have other effects. It will affect the biota in the soil, it will affect other plants, it will affect the crop. So we need to keep all of those things in mind. It will affect also what happens in next year's crop. Like one of the things we're having to look at in agriculture now where we use a lot of herbicides is what did we spray on the paddock last year? Because it'll stop certain crops from growing this year. And I've seen on the ground in paddocks activities that happened five years ago affect what's growing in the paddock this year. And you can actually see in places where um, a fellow has pulled his scarifier out of the ground and done a loop to drop tangled weeds or something in it out. And you can see that loop in the paddock years later when the crop grows. It's usually better, actually. It's interesting. We also have very strictly enforced monocultures. So when we grow a paddock of wheat, we want wheat. We don't want barley. We don't want ryegrass. We don't want hogweed. We don't want wild radish. We don't want tame radish. Um, <laughs> we just want wheat. Another thing that's happened in the grain growing areas in Australia is we're excluding grazing animals. Uh, there are farms not far from me where they've removed all fences, including boundary fences. So the area they crop stretches from road to road. There is no option of putting grazing animals in and making that a part of their farming system. Um, and we hand, tend to have a, sim a symptomatic response to issues. So if we've got a particular issue in a paddock, we go and get the expert in from the chemical shop and he says, buy 400 litres of that and spray it there. And that fixes that symptom. We rarely ever ask why has that happened in the paddock. And that's something we're going to, I believe, have to do more and more in the future. Um, one example that I've had happen in my field is, is, is the weed we have over there. I use the term weed in the broadest possible sense, once again without becoming royal, um, called stinkwort. Stinkwort is an accumulator of metals, um, like many broadleaf weeds are. So it'll pull up copper and zinc and lead and antimony and aluminium, which is a heavy metal, believe it or not, um, up to the surface of the ground. Now, when it turned up in my paddock, my father was still alive and I was talking to him about it and he said, well, back around the time of World War II, the stinkwort became very, very dominant along the Wimmera River, which runs past our farm, to the extent that the rabbits he used to trap to make a living in those days were all black around the mouth from the sap of the stinkwort because it was all they had to eat. There was nothing else there. Well, if you go along the river now, and this is 50 years later, of course, there's almost no stinkwort. So conventional wisdom is you've got stinkwort there or you've got to go and get some amine, a hormone spray, and spray it to kill it. Got to do it. It's almost legislated to do it because it's a, a declared weed. <coughs> I didn't tell anyone I had the stinkwort in my paddock and I left it there. I just ignored it, cropped through it, whatever. In the first year, it was quite thick. 
In the second year, there were a few plants here and there and a little patch over there. In the third year, there was a plant here, a plant there, and a plant over there. Why did that happen? Now, I spoke to the expert from the chemical shop and I said, why did that happen? And he said, oh, I don't know. You should have sprayed it. <laughs> so maybe someone doesn't know something. <laughs> So, in my view, and this is after some years of farming, we need a far more holistic approach. We need to consider our farm as a system that doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end, or a top or a bottom or a left or a right. It's this huge hole, and if we take one thing out of it and look at it in isolation, we will get it wrong. So, we need to be far more holistic in how we do it. We need to listen to the soil. That bit about the stinkwort growing in the paddock, what was the soil trying to tell me? Like if I have absolutely bare soil in my paddocks in summer and we get anything vaguely resembling rain, we get a thing called um, Afghan melon, paddy melon, um, some of the rude people in our area call them a bastard melon, um, will grow there. To me that's the soil telling me I don't care if it's hot and summer and dry, I want cover so the paddy melons grow. Now interestingly, if I go and spray the paddy melons, I will have a lot of paddy melons the next year and the next year and the next year if I keep spraying. So I've done the same thing with the paddy melons over the last few years. <coughs> what happens, seems to happen, is that the paddy melons will grow the first year the second year you'll get brome grass, which isn't a real nice grass, but it's better than paddy melons. <laughs> the next year you'll get rye grass, which is a lot better than brome grass, and the sheep will eat it. So maybe the soil is telling me something and it's actually healing itself. Is this possible? <laughs> <laughs> Jack will be tested later. <laughs> Yeah, so th this is plant succession. It's something I've, I've read a little bit about and I'd like to read a lot more about it. So if anyone knows any really good plant succession publications, please tell me about them. Soil biota. Every crop I grow on my place, with the exception of canola, which I don't think I'll grow anymore, um, grows in a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. The man from the chemical shop tells me I should treat my seed with a fungicide. Pardon? Like, are we missing something here? Are we not thinking systemically? I've got to put a fungicide on it to stop rust later on, but the plant wants to grow in conjunction with the fungus. So, once again, my closet bioterrorist has stepped out and I haven't used seed fungicides for quite a while now. We need to be aware that many of the techs, techniques we use for systemic responses um, have a real cost and the cost can go on for quite some time. And the other trick, and remember at one of the earlier slides said if you go broke you stop farming. I would rather grow a two bag to the acre crop for a profit than a 30 bag crop for a loss. One of the first rules of farming is um, don't go broke. So I had access to an old wheat. Um, it's an old wheat called turvy. And what I liked about it was it grew tall. And a little bit more about that later. I suspected it might have been competitive against weeds. I suspected it might have worked better with the soil biota. Because it was tall, it would produce more straw, and Australian soils tend to be very low in organic carbon. So we do all sorts of funny tricks to try and preserve organic carbon. Harvestability was, I thought, might be an issue because the old wheats tended to be very long season. So you couldn't harvest them until after Christmas, and my goodness, we have to finish harvest before Christmas or we're after all the other neighbours. Um, if you've got the right product, you can actually get into some pretty good market segments. And, and I'll just mention a couple of little figures there that will remain a secret between you and I. 
Um, the old wheats aren't owned by anyone. And that, I believe, is becoming a very important issue. In the last year or two, there's been some legislation put up in the EEC to outlaw the growing of varieties of plants that are not on, a, on an approved list. It's run into problems, thankfully. But those people who have these GM crops, which to me is a mechanism for collecting patents and control, don't want us growing publicly owned varieties or heritage varieties or something that they don't own or that some other company that they can buy out might own. And also I'm stubborn. <coughs> so this wheat's called turvy. This one I found and the reason I could get hold of it was it was one of the old farmers who lives about 20 kilometres from me always grew a bit every couple of years because quote unquote his chooks liked it. So I did a bit of research on turvy and here's a photograph taken in 1933 of a man harvesting turvy with a Fordson engine powered HV McKay harvester. And to me that's not a bad looking crop and it's a wonderful looking header and I really like the air conditioning. <laughs> so this is a quote from, I, I traced it back as far as 1915, this is the earliest reference I could find to turvy wheat. 1915, comparing it to a wheat called Scottish Wonder. Probably has a tartan husk or something. <laughs> I then found another publication and there's a couple of people in the room who are interested in wheat varieties. The reference at the bottom might well be worth copying down. So turvy was a selection which means that it wasn't a bred wheat it was a farmer had a paddock of wheat called purple straw and he picked the best of it and used that as his seed. And purple straw, I think there it goes back almost, as, uh, back to about 1860. So there's a rather old wheat. So we've been told for years that we've got 4% improvement with this species this year and we've got 6% improvement with the species before, the variety before that and if you grow this wheat over here that we bred in 1960 you'll get 8% better yield and so on. So we've had all these incremental yields for years and years and years and so it's a bit of a risk to grow this old wheat because it probably won't perform. It wouldn't be accepted by the bulk handling authorities because we have a list of approved varieties to deliver for milling into uh, the wheat receival places in Australia. So it would only be sold as feed wheat because it's not blessed. I'd therefore have to provide my own storage. I'd probably have to sell it in smaller parcels so I can't just say here's a thousand tonnes, take it away please and give me lots of money. And if I talk to the man from the chemical shop he'll say, I don't know. <laughs> The upside is there are actually markets that want this stuff. They want the old wheat because they don't trust the new ones. There's a whole subculture almost of people who pursue these old heritage foods and all power to their elbow. They're wonderful people. Because they'll pay me a bit more for it. They don't mind if I do the processing and they're fairly easy to find because you go to the farmers markets and there they are and they dress beautifully. <laughs> so I have a little flour mill, this is it, the little stone mill, and it makes a hell of a racket, but it turns turvy wheat into a very nice flour. One of the other little things that's believed is that flour from wheat should be used within 70 hours of milling, or it loses its beautifulness. Okay. Here's turvy wheat growing. I think that's a turvy, hang on, let me just check. No, it's not. That's the modern wheat growing. Um, you'll note we have some little yellow flowers, we call them dandelions down there. Cape weed is another word for it. There's a few weeds in there, but that's looking along the rows of a modern wheat called Clearfield Jans. So it's a Jans wheat that's been bred to be resistant to a chemical a clearfield group of chemicals which you can control some grass weeds in wheat. This is the old wheat. 
Note the colour, note the width of the leaves, note the very few weeds. I'll just go back to the Jans. There's Turvey. Right, 1860. Didn't have a clue, did they? <laughs> no idea. Like, how can you grow rubbish like that? Uh, this is an old oat I also grow. That's the front of one of my old tractors. Uh, this is an oat called Swan. It dates from about 1860. Uh, sorry, 1960. Um, it's a hay oat. The grain off this actually made milling quality, which is a bit unusual, which is basically a, a weight thing. It, it's suitable for industrial processing. <coughs> um, horse people. Are there any horse people here? Uh, the horse racing industry love these because horses go faster on Swan. <laughs> These are the heads of turvy wheat. You see, they're a good size, they're a nice open head. No horns. Horns uh, are the little whiskery, hairy bits on the head of the grain. Um, when they dwarfed wheat in Australia, the gene for horns is apparently quite close to the gene for dwarf. And they couldn't separate the two. So they were trying to develop an ornless wheat that wouldn't gather rainfall when it was ripe with a dwarf, but they couldn't separate them. One of our early awned dwarf wheats, you dwarf a wheat because you want to grow straw, not grain. Uh, well, sorry, other way around. You want to grow grain, not straw. Because we, you know, wheat's a, a grain thing. A little more about that later. There's the height of it. I don't know who that ugly old coot is, but he should get out of my paddock. <laughs> now, our modern dwarf wheats grow about knee high. Okay. Another head of wheat. And there it is, ripening, getting closer to ripe. The very open head, if we get rainfall on that in summer, um, what can happen with wheat is if the, if the grain gets wet and stays wet for a little while, it can germinate in the head, um, which means it's no longer any good for milling. But because the heads are a little bit open, um, they breathe and they can dry out more quickly. Now, here is the modern wheat in the foreground and the old wheat in the background. I grew them in the same paddock, side by side, same treatment, some on the same day. And here, this, this is interesting. The closer wheat, the, the lighter colour is the modern wheat, that's the Clearfield Jans. The green wheat in the background is the turvy. Now this year, the year this photo was taken, didn't finish well. We get good finishing rains in the spring about one year in four and this wasn't one of them. And I was looking at that green old wheat and I thought I am in deep doo-doo here because we're not getting any rain, there's no moisture in the ground, the grain's not going to fill, I'm going to end up with a box full of chaff and pinched grain. The yield, this is an 18, uh, 1860 wheat which was selected in 1915 or thereabouts compared with the modern wheat, the yield was identical. The protein was within 0.1 of a percent, which is less than the accuracy of the machines that measure it. And the screenings in the modern wheat were three times the screening in the old wheat, and the, they ripened a month later with no rainfall. Now, I was talking to um, a lady called Margaret Roper. She's a soil microbiologist at Syro in Perth about this wheat before I harvested it, and I said, look, I'm in trouble. The, um, the old turvy is still green and we're not getting any rain. She said, don't worry about it, it's tall, it'll have deep roots. She was right. It was a beautiful, nice, plump grain, lovely colour. Now, Wendy, who's sitting back there, hold up your hand please, Wendy. My part, <laughs> no, right up. <laughs> Wendy makes bread with this wheat, as do a number of other people. Now, normally when I sell my wheat, I get about 300 $320 a tonne for it, delivered. I mill this wheat, now this is a secret bit that's just between you and I, no one's allowed to know. When I mill this wheat, I can sell it to people for $6,000 a tonne. Okay? 
The bread it makes is denser because it's uh, turvy's a dual purpose wheat. So it's not a really highly developed bread wheat, but it's, it produces a denser bread, much like the loaves you'll buy at the farmer's markets. It's got a lovely nutty flavour. It's actually got a taste, sort of a nutty, malty sort of flavour that you just don't get with modern flours. Uh, it's quite delightful. Remember I mentioned our soils are very, very old, 300 million years in some cases, and we have very low organic matter. So the taller wheat suited me because it produced more straw, and therefore, logically, Jack might disagree with me, it's likely to put a bit more carbon into the soil. It's likely to give me better biomass in the soil for the bugs to eat and so on, so I can actually get the soil to function better. <coughs> this is... Um, a paddock where I grew the turvy in the background and the modern wheat in the foreground. That gives you some idea of the biomass left behind by the tall turvy compared to a modern wheat. So maybe I'm on a winner. So my conclusions, growing crops requires a holistic vision. Oh, by the way, with the grazing, after we harvest, we often run sheep in. I've got, I sometimes call them lice taxis, but not lately, thankfully. Um, I run sheep. They love the straw. It's actually, they get a good value out of the straw because I don't spray out the ryegrass, so they get some value from that. They get some value from the wheat straw and they've got somewhere to hide from the weather because the straw is still taller than the sheep, even after harvest, so that works. So we've got that holistic view. Um, you just don't look at one aspect. If you get uh, stink wart in your paddock, don't just say I've got stink wart spray it with amine. Why is it there? It's there doing something. Have a think about it. Find out what that particular weed does. And stink wart is a metal accumulator and the soils at home are deficient in copper. So maybe it's pulling copper up from the subsoil. And import-based farming systems where you have to have a lot of fertiliser, you have to have a lot of sprays, I don't consider to be anywhere near sustainable enough to keep us going into the next generation and the generation after that. Research. Uh, I'm probably going to upset some people here, um, but our research model is wrong. Our governments have relinquished responsibility for what I consider effectively to be stuff owned by the people. Where corporate rights have become dominant to people or community rights. So now the research is profit driven where you have to come up with a marketable outcome preferably by next year. The research conforms to industrial processing requirements. At that research place in Horsham, there is a kitchen. And the kitchen make wheat to, or make bread to a formula from the flour made from the various varieties of wheat. They stick it into an oven and bake it to a formula. And if it's not nice at the other end, it's wrong. Simple as that. <coughs> the seed bank they've got there, and I was in that seed bank the other day as part of a rotary visit and I was told not to steal anything. <laughs> I didn't. Um, <laughs> the seed bank, the land races, are only seen as a source of genes to stick in the patentable varieties that the companies want to own. That's basically where they are now. Our governments need to step up and do the blue sky research, do the stuff that isn't going to yield a profit next year or the year after or the year after. We need to look at getting farming 